living rap living with Jonathan and Katie Welcome, Welcome to, to living, living with, with Jonathan, Jonathan and Katie. <laughs> Stop laughing. Okay, we're just going to keep going. Okay. That is literally the 12th time we've tried <laughs> to do our intro, but we need to keep going. Welcome to Living with Jonathan and Katie. I am Katie French and I am... Horny. <laughs> <laughs> you know you are. Never. I can smell it. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Katie French and I have a problem with plants. I've bought too many. Oh, God. I'm Jonathan Serta Raul, and I'm prejudiced against Milano mint cookies. <laughs> don't make them. They're awful. <laughs> Please don't make them anymore. Um, today on the podcast, we are talking about immigration. Yeah. We're talking about immigration, um, America's relationship with immigrants. Yeah. Um, and it, we're all immigrants. Yeah. We all descend from immigrants. Yes. Unless you're a native of LA and you're a native Tongva person. Right, or wherever, tribe. or wherever you are in this nation. Yeah. But um, we're all immigrants. Yeah, all of our families are. Beyond my hatred for Milano mint cookies is people who are white. Are <laughs> yes, um, which is part of why I hate Milano. Yes. Um, no, you hate the Milano who... in the mirror when you look at it. <laughs> the Milano in the mirror. The Milano. Oh God. Because <laughs> you're part white. It's the Milano <laughs> in the mirror. Oh yeah. Yeah, I hate. I'm quarter. I'm I'm twenty five percent Milano. Cookie. You are Milano <laughs> cookie. Yeah. Um, men, m- much of this may get cut, but yeah. Um, I really like. Sorry, I really hate how um, people can be so anti-immigrant. Um, I think it's one of the most like inhumane, apathetic, un um, loving thing to be that type of stance. You know pretty much in any country what do you think yeah no i agree especially in america we really are a nation of immigrants and we know that because we were all our families got here somehow right how did and we were we were lucky to be born in this era in this place right. on earth and that's because of our immigrant ancestors yeah how but, did your family get here oh god how didn't they get here <laughs> snuck into the cracks <laughs> flew in through the windows no um my family came here in two ways my dad's side is pretty quick to describe. My dad is half Mexican, half white. And his white side got here, I think, from just, like, coming over from Europe. Like, you know, the same as your ancestors, I think. And then the Mexican side, they've been here since it was Mexico. So that side of the family probably has been in the U.S. longer than any other part of my family. Yeah. They've been in the U.S. since it was Mexico. And then before it was Mexico when it was New Spain. And then, of course, we have indigenous ancestry, so we have um, ancestors who have been in the land since it, since yeah. before Europeans even came. And so they've always been here. So they, they've they had a very different relationship with the U.S. because they always felt that they were kind of overtaken and mm-hmm. that the land was, you know, the border crossed them and that they were treated like second-class citizens in their own land, which is what happened, you know? Yeah. Treated as immigrants in a land that they didn't immigrate to when they came up. They were, it was all Mexico and they were moving uh, from Jalisco to the New Mexico area, but they just looked at that because it was Mexico as we're just moving north, you know? So that's how my dad's family got here. My mom, she's from Mexico. She, uh, her family came in the sixties and they immigrated over um, with the help of some family who had already previously immigrated 20 years prior who were already living in LA. They helped contact um, some Mexican American politician or or someone who worked it, it had some type of pull in immigration, and they were able to get the family over. Um, and they only waited like a year in Tijuana, which is still a long time because yeah. like there was a guy like it was very hard in Tijuana. They said like my abuelita was at the end of her rope. She wanted to either cross uh, without papers or go back to Michoacan where they came from. Because living in Tijuana was hellish at the time and she had five kids and she had no job and she had her sons out, you know, selling flowers in the streets and she was making food for everyone in the neighborhood because there was a lot of people who didn't have a lot of resources. There was a guy who was killing people at the time there and my mom was w- almost one of his victims and she oh got my thrown God. into a well. Yeah. What? It was, it's, it's a crazy story, but. And they were fleeing Michoacan. They were fleeing tr- they were, violence in Michoacan. They were fleeing the cartels in Michoacan. Um, the they were going around and killing um, any 
eldest sons of landowners mm. and my abuelito owned a small p- plot of land it was like a little farm you know way out in rural michoacan because of if they do that then they can kind of consolidate land mm. um so he feared for his son's safety my tío jorge and, and my tío javier who were teenagers at the time so perfect age to get murdered by the cartel yeah because they that's the time when you are starting to work you know yeah. like my abuelito started working when he was 12 so 15 16 you're totally able to um you know be in charge of pieces of land, especially if you grew up knowing how to work it, you know? Yeah. And so he, they, they fled the family to Tijuana and my, my, my abuelita was alone with her five kids. My abuelita was already in the U S because he was lucky that he happened to be born in East LA and never knew it until he was in his mid twenties. My abuelita was born here because his mom was, he was from Mexico, but his mom, she, she was from Mexico, but she like grew up here. So she like immigrated as a small child. So she's basically like Mexican American. Mm. And then she met this Mexican dude from Michoacan, which is my abuelito's dad. And then they had two of the kids in East LA, but then raised them, went back to Mexico. I don't know why mm. they went back, but they this was like back in the twenties. Um, but yeah, but that's pretty crazy because that means that my great grandma was a Mexican American chick back in like the early 1900s LA and there are pictures we found of her like in East LA or in front of LA City Hall way back then and you know she's from Mexico but she grew up here so it's like I have more in common with my great grandma than I do with my grandpa who you know he was born in East LA but he grew up completely in Mexico and didn't even know he had citizenship until he was an adult because from 12 to the time that he was 20 they were like he was going around Mexico just working. Yeah. He was kicked out of the house when he was 12, just abandoned. And so they, someone told him, Oh, you can get work in the U S you know? And he was like, Oh, and, and they found out, Oh, he's a, he's a citizen. So actually several people tried to kill him because of course you could steal his documents and his paper. And at that time with that, but way before digital, this was back in the fifties, right? Yeah. You could kind of, if you kind of looked like him, you know, you could kind of like fudge it and sure. use it as, as your paper, you know, and take on his identity. So when he knew that, that's when he started to go back and forth from the U.S. and Mexico and send money back and come back to his family. But eventually when they wanted to come over, he had to stay in the U.S. in order to secure their life and get everything ready. And he was doing everything he could to get them over. But the process was way more complicated. Mm. Um, It wasn't easy to get just his family, even though it was his wife and his kids. It wasn't easy. He had to enlist the help of one of our cousins who had immigrated 20 years prior and then find someone in the fucking government bureaucracy that was an ally who helped the family come over. And it was like real quick like my abuelita was at the end of her rope and they were kind of like we're turning back or we're crossing that's the deal then they contacted them and were like you have you know 12 hours to get down here maybe even less um and if you don't get down here right away then this spot may go to someone else so you have you have a limited window to get you and the kids down here Mm. to the border ready to go and that's how they were able to cross over it was by chance you know and i was telling you earlier that's something that a lot of people don't understand about crossing legally or illegally, quote unquote, even though I don't believe anyone's illegal. It's left up to chance. Yeah. Had she decided to cross, she would have crossed without papers if she just couldn't wait. If she had decided to take the family the day before, had she gone back to Michoacan, they would have missed it. You know, it's yeah. like you crossing legally or not is a lot of time by necessity emergency and chance it, those are the factors that play into it yeah that's how my family got here what about you Katie? the drama the drama um yeah. yeah i uh i know most of my family history since we're as we've talked about in our web series we're related to pt barnum and um so he did genealogy and ancestry so we know our little thing um the og family that got here well two sides like on my mom's side um, it was two brothers in like the 1600s who were indentured servants. They were like 15 and 17. They were like the sons number like 12 and 13 of their family in England. So obviously like nothing. Wow. They were poor. They were, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, so, yeah, they came over and they worked off there in, in servitude. And uh, then they were farmers basically for a long time where um in uh like new england connecticut kind of area and then eventually into um 
like the Midwest. And then my, that was my mom's dad's side, my mom's mom's side. Um, they were Swedish and they came over in the 1800s and they went to Minnesota to like Iron Mountain, Minnesota or whatever. Very Scandinavian. That's where all Scandinavian people go. Um, and this last year, my mom went, found our ancestral village in Sweden. It's called Orenbro. And uh, she went and they actually, there's like very good historical um, records because it's Scandinavian for some reason they're good at all that stuff so they were actually taken to the actual like farm in this really small um countryside little yeah. spot and what the really crazy thing is that we have this really f um in our family we have this recipe for rye bread and it's like the thing all the women in my family pass down to each other it's like initiation into like the family like all the women know how to make it and stuff and then we found out that actually like the type of the recipe we use is an adaptation of a type of Swedish bread that is from that region and specifically from that like um, village. And basically it's the type of bread that was made for the um, larger landowner in town, like the mine, like basically it was like one of our ancestors was like a maid in like a bigger estate house. Wow. And so even this bread is called like, say you were the Lord of that house. It's called like Jonathan's bread. Oh, so it's Lord kinda... Brantham's bread. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we figured out too, that, and then like our current adaptations are all like cheaper substitutes. Cause obviously that's what you would be making it with. Right. But so it was crazy that I was like, wow, of everything of historical documents of everything we've ever like found, it's actually the family bread that is like, the one thing that's traced all the way back to that that's village. Crazy. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. So I, I'm, I want to go um, Wait, eventually. but how did they get from Sweden to the U.S.? Um, they left, you know. No, it was, a, it was a, there were two, there was like my great, 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 whatever, grandfather. And then he met my um, grandmother, who I think was also, um, a, she was a Swedish immigrant too, but right. they met there. So he, he left, you know. But what's interesting about Sweden is that you can repatriate if you have the birth certificate of your ancestor who left. Wow. And apparently they like apologized. That's very Scandinavian. In the last like sorry. in 50 years, they said. like they like public the government or something publicly apologized to all immigrants that ever had to leave because of like the monarchy or the situations. Right. And so apparently, supposedly I can legally still repatriate in Sweden. That's crazy. If I need to. Would you ever do that? If I, mean, I needed to. They have better health care. If I needed to, yeah. That's crazy. You'll that's probably be a shorty, though. Everyone's probably really tall there. Maybe. But may what if I could be like, you know, the Amy Schumer of Sweden? What does that mean? Oh, it's <laughs> stand up. Yeah. You have to learn Swedish, though. Yeah. That's and crazy. And I'd be like, <laughs> you guys know yeah. it. But say, no matter who your family was, they came here with an accent. They absolutely did. Think about that. Yeah. A sl or a slutson, as we say. What would you feel if you moved, if you had to flee? Like mm -hmm. if, if, if something happened in America that yeah. raised the political climate to a point where there was a government coup um, and it completely became undemocratic and a dictatorship and there were people fleeing, what would you, can you even imagine having to restart your life, having it just totally disrupted in another country that you have, like France, like no, let's yeah, say France yeah. is where you sought asylum. Like yeah. that's who accepted you. No, I've always truly felt this that like I don't even go to different grocery stores because I can't figure out where the stuff is. Yeah, I can't imagine when people come here, like especially older or later in life, totally new country, totally yeah. new customs, totally new language. Like must be so disorienting. Yeah, and also I also have compassion to think about like so say it did get like really heated here and we had to leave. There actually there is a great heartbreak that you would be like. That's not the America I knew. Right. You know, and it's hard because a lot of people have to make that choice of do I fight to try to save my country or right. do I leave because it's too far gone. Right. You know, and I think I would be very, I would actually be very sad if I like left right. and was telling my kids like, oh, no, this is how it used to be. But it's not anymore. You know. Right. So I feel like um, I'm very I'm very like cognizant of that and very aware. And as much as um, things are crazy, like, you know, it's we're still lucky that we get to say whatever we want and be like the president's an idiot and no one's knocking on our door and taking us out in the middle of the night so anyway some fun stuff to think about guys it, about it, your own history and heritage and how you got here and who helped absolutely you get here. like this may have been a heavier intro but it's something that's close to both of our hearts yeah and um the interview that's following is with a very funny stand-up johan miranda and he's amazing um, he's been a fixture here in the LA scene. Like everyone I know loves his comedy, loves him as a person. And he just has a very interesting story. That's very similar to a, what a lot of people are going through. Yeah. You know, so please enjoy our interview. Thank you. 
I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born in Lima, Peru. Uh, Woo! It's always, it's always one. <laughs> uh, moved out here to California when I was three. Uh, my family, I wasn't like an ambitious ass baby. <laughs> <laughs> See later on, I got dreams. <laughs> Some money later. <laughs> we came here on a tourist visa. We came here on vacation. Uh, and we're just not done sightseeing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, came, came here undocumented. Um, was I got DACA when I was 22, which is uh, a, an executive order passed by Obama uh, that basically gives uh, young undocumented youth um, access to uh, driver's license, work permit, and so basically lets us work and live here. It's a, it's a temporary status that I have to renew every mm -hmm. every two years. Um, mm -hmm. Meaning you go in like um, let them or you you I, re, I, I re pay, up. I pay the government four hundred and ninety five dollars every two years. Okay. So, so they don't ruin my life. Yeah. <laughs> it's extortion. Is what it is. <laughs> they're they're shaking me down for my money. And I, I have to renew actually pretty soon. Uh, um and yeah, every so I, I get I, it's called DACA and I, I renew it every two years and with that I, I have this work permit and protected status. Um and that's uh, DACA is um, on the chopping block. It's going to get uh, decided by the Supreme Court on uh, in the spring. Trump tried to repeal it, and then some lower co courts repeal like um, didn't fall. Like it's going to get decided by the Supreme, Co Supreme Court. And from from what I've read by um, legal experts, is a uh, it's most likely going to get struck down. And so that's sort of where we're at right now. I imagine what what Trump's going to do is you try to use it. Well, I, he's going to basically be like, all right, we'll save the DACA uh, program, but in exchange, give us the wall or other immigration, you know? Mm. So, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, sorry, sorry, you were asking. So, you, at, at what age did you understand oh, yeah. that you were undocumented and what that meant? Um, I always knew I was an immigrant. Like, I, you know, my mom would tell me about Peru and how different it was. Um, and I just, I, I didn't really understand that there was, like, different degrees of immigrants. I mm -hmm. thought we all just had heart, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like what's, you know, uh, my, like, I had some hints here and there, like, um, my, um, my mom was able to drive us to school, like, when I was, like, I forget what age, when I was maybe elementary. And I remember one, like, one, uh, I just remember that she wasn't able to drive anymore uh, because Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, he campaigned on the promise to uh, not let undocumented immigrants drive. So my mom wasn't able to drive. Um, and so that gave me a hint of like, oh, there's like a, this is like a special, like this is not a, this is like a thing. It's not really. And so, and I think by the time I got to high school, like uh, especially when you're, you know, considering college, I wasn't, College wasn't really. This is before um, the California Dream Act, which allows undocumented students to pay into in-state tuition. I think that passed mm -hmm. in like two thousand eight. Or so when I was in high school, college was not really a an option because like if I if I wanted to go to college or even community college, like I had to pay out-of-state tuition, which means like four times. Oh, I didn't know that's yeah, the jurisdiction. That, okay, that was like that, at the time. Say. At the time, so I was like. Um, when I when I started figuring that out, I was like, "Oh, this, it's this is like a special like this is not normal. This is like the yeah. like thing that's." So your parents did they ever have a talk to you about like, don't tell people like, in my mind it's like that, but I'm like and being undocumented <laughs> is like being Anne Frank or something is like, hey, right, don't say right, anything, yeah. don't tell people, just like yeah, yeah. You would think it would be like a talk, like like you know, like a talk. I imagine a parent gives you to. Let you know that you're adopted. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something like that. Something like, oh, yeah, you. this, this yeah. isn't your real country. <laughs> uh, you think it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, they they never sat me down and gave me that. I mean, my dad never even gave me the talk. <laughs> like, <laughs> the other talk about how you got here on planet Earth. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, I think it's just you know, you know. Um, so no, I I, I kind of just put the pieces together, and they, you know. I think I just I think it just happens something slowly and naturally over time. You, you realize or like you realize, things. and also my parents just like, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> so they would just say, hey, yeah, that's not something you can do. Yeah, yeah. It's like so. It's like, um, um, 
I think, yeah, I think a combination of the news because, you know, yeah, especially um, uh, around the time I was high school and uh, high school, it, it, it did become like, you know, a, the third rail of politics where it's yeah. like, and I remember 2006, uh, there was a national protest of, uh, I think, in response to like a really anti-immigrant law in Arizona. Um, and so there, I, there was a growing consciousness of like what, what, what just in general. Um, and so... I think as in high school, I, I started, yeah, realizing like what exactly position I'm in and what the landscape is. It's like what what opportunities and I have and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I grew up undocumented uh, or illegal, depending on which news station you watch. And uh, when we first moved here, we moved to San Francisco uh, in the Fillmore, which when I was a kid growing up there, it was a, it was a black neighborhood. Not really the case anymore. It's been gentrified. I have conflicted feelings about gentrification because, like, obviously, when it comes to my migration here in this country, I have like liberal views on immigration. Yet, when it comes to white people moving into my own neighborhood, I'm like, we have to build a wall. <laughs> I think my it was if I understand if I if I understand correctly, but my dad it was like kind of between New York and San Francisco mm -hmm. and. San Francisco seems nice, like nicer, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it was still affordable. Yeah. Somewhat. I mean, we lived like in a studio, uh, but it was still like, um, yeah, affordable. And um, like first and second grade, I w I went to a bilingual school, which is so most of my classmates were uh, immigrants, mm. uh, and we spoke Spanish and learned English. And so it's it's hard to tell like what like. Uh, to me, that was the norm. That right. was like, that was, I thought, you know, everyone, that, I thought that was the whole country. Yeah. And then we got priced out of San Francisco. Uh, we had to move to Pinole in the East Bay. And that was just like a, a, a merit, like just English um, public school. And, um, and it's more like suburbs, you know, like more, um, I mean, going back to your, to your question, like, um, I felt more just like a city kid, you know, like yeah. <laughs> going to, to me more than anything. I had no concept of America, like, or I still don't really. I, I mean, I grew up all, it's been 30 years old. I've lived all of it, most of it in California. So this, that's my favorite reference to everything. And yeah. so when I go to somewhere else, I'm like, what, is, what the fuck is this? <laughs> You're talking about Arizona? <laughs> this, this, is, this is in California? <laughs> like, I didn't really understand that there, there, there is a lot of resentment towards California for people <laughs> because we think we're better. And I've, I've, as I, you know, as I've gone, I'm kind of leaning into that. Like I, we are, <laughs> we are. Yeah, I am. Like, well, that's the thing is, it's yeah. like because like even uh, in, in San Francisco, I was uh, it was immigrant, you know, classmates, and then even in Pinal, like it was like a quarter white, a quarter black, a, a quarter it's Hispanic. Diverse. It's yeah. super diverse. Yeah. So like when I when I go to other places and they have these like, oh, you guys are like, you guys have racism here, like, right? You know, it's like it's, it just feels like time travel. It's like. <laughs> It's like going to like one of those like uh it's like going to like a civil war reenactment like <laughs> this exists like what, what do you guys do like it, it's yeah that's how i feel more like i yeah i guess i identify more like, as a californian than an american yeah so at what age did you like not just how did like being undocumented affect you but like what was kind of like what were like barriers so you said like you realized like you can't go to college but how did you realize that um like who did, did your mom tell you or no. was it just like you just kind of um no um i i think yeah i think by the time i was like a sophomore junior when you start i you know you know i had the internet you know i didn't sure <laughs> sure sure I, I could look it up and and yeah and yeah going back to what we were saying earlier like because 2006 was the national march for or uh, uh immigrant rights like mm -hmm. it was like the first beginning of big what we deal. Have, the yeah. contemporary immigrant rights movement so i think around that time i became aware of like what what the, yeah what and with becoming aware i you know just googled like what what's what, what's what's the deal <laughs> with the, yeah yeah <laughs> with being undocumented yeah, yeah and yeah and i think in a big way i i uh, governor schwarzenegger was the first time i had to think about it like why is he going so hard and he won like he he won the election because of that and yeah so that made me as a yeah. fucking yeah. immigrant and that's why these immigrants are a problem no, I'm kidding. I, I, I i try to bring i always bring that up because he to me is the prototype of you know trump um and even though now he's like trying to portray himself as like a centrist or like reasonable conservative uh he no he he totally like his whole campaign was the anti-immigrant 
Um, that's how he won against uh, the, the recall against Reed Davis. Um, but if there weren't immigrants, where would his baby mamas come from? <laughs> what was your kind of like life, like vision of your life? Or I, I kind of floundered in high school. Uh, I um, I think I, st I had a good first year. You know, so I, <laughs> I, I, had, I had some B's, some, so, some, some solid B's, you know, um, and then sophomore, not so if, and then like junior or senior, I was checked out. I was like, cutting and like senior year I, like i got i think like sh straight f's or like just like really bad and the counselor was like you're not going to graduate like you have to go to like an alternative school and like do packets but do you like knowing that you couldn't go to college do you think that that's also why you were like i don't care yeah i think so i mean hindsight i mean i i, I the only reason i hesitate is because like, i asked Anisha, like i was kind of maybe just like a lazy piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> but i i'm sure i'm sure that but it's fun to yeah, yeah, blame yeah. it on that yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to catch you up uh, to speed with right now I have DACA which is a protected status which the Supreme Court is going to decide on which means if it gets repealed uh, I'm going to lose my driver's license work permit and be vulnerable to deportation uh, it's my new Tinder bio right now and <laughs> the way I would describe it to people is like this is the first time in my life where I've ever had the thought of like well maybe I should lose some weight because uh, it just feels like at some point in the next couple of years I'm going to have to like run or something <laughs> so yeah I'm undocumented I'm fat uh, I'm also often referred to as a person of color I don't really like the term uh, people of color I don't know <laughs> I'll explain like you guys know that term colored people that's like a historically racist term it just feels like they switch it around to people of color. It's like, no, it's fine. I'm like, I can't go up to you and be like, hey, what's up, sucker of cock? No, it's cool. I switch it around. It's fine now. I'm proud. So when you did graduate through your packets, um, what did you do? What were you, what was your plan, life plan? I don't. I was pretty hopeless. I I I didn't. I yeah. I didn't really. Yeah, because there at the time, DACA wasn't even on the horizon. I, yeah. I wasn't sure what to do or what to. Yeah, those were rough years. Um, yeah. That because I got DACA like in two, 21, 22. So I was partying. You know, I, I was kind of just living day by day. You know, just um, I, I had I had no real hope. Um, I think or when I was like around twenty one, I I started going <laughs> going to open mics. Um. Because at that point, what, like what, when you don't have nothing to lose, you yeah. might that's as well when you start well, comedy. Yeah, always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can we talk about? So I think that something like some people don't realize is like, can we talk about all the things you can't do if you're undocumented? So like you said, driving, driving, can't go to school, school. what can't work, can't work legally. Um, what you're kind of like trapped at every yeah, no health care. I'm assuming no obviously healthcare. you no. can't. Uh, contrary to people's beliefs, you can't get welfare because no, you're no not welfare. in the system. No. Um. So. Well, yeah what can you <laughs> so yeah. what's the deal? what do you do what yeah. can you do I, I didn't know what what i was going to do and so i just I, I started doing comedy and i was like oh well I, this will keep me distracted at least this will. yeah I would, in high school i would go to like live shows and then like and then i was like oh then i would go to open mics and see what the local scene is like and um i remember when i started it was san francisco scene was still relatively small it was, there wasn't mics every day and then within a year there was like it grew like almost exponentially and that's it and so yeah and that kept me and like oh, like i think it helped a lot it kept me involved in something it gave me a community and yeah. uh yeah and then i got DACA in 22 uh, when i was 22 and then in so what year was that 2012 okay 2012 yeah and uh, was that were you nervous about that or like excited because it involves you going on record right in, about being undocumented yeah you have to I, sign up and tell them basically i remember i um i told my cousin Fernando and a couple of, who was also at the time undocumented and um, a couple others that I know are undocumented. Like, cause I, I remember seeing like June 5th, I remember seeing it cause it was an executive order. Like it, he just literally, uh, it, he announced it and it's just, it's just, it, he said, I, yeah. It's like he dropped an album basically. He dropped the, he did the Beyonce thing. Yeah. 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 Um, and I remember seeing it in the news and I just, I was like, it just, uh, I, I was I was excited. I was like, "Fucking Jesus Christ! What a what a godsend!" And I but I do remember telling other people, and 
there being um, hesitation or at least suspicion. Or I was like, well, because yeah, you it, it it said you it basically means like yeah, you have to submit your paperwork to the government as an undocumented immigrant. You have to say this is who I am, this is how long I've been, you know. And so yeah, it's, yeah and so there was that suspicion, and I. I, and I actually, I remember I was the one that was telling Fernando and all, like, no, let's, you know, let's do it. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, can, you know, they can't. What's the worst that can happen? You know, and <laughs> cut to. Yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I still don't regret. I mean, you know, it's it's been a good time. It's been a good run. <laughs> <laughs> so, but DACA meant, it meant that uh, you could, um, what did it mean for you? Like it meant that you could get a work permit and that you could get temporary status. Like what is it? it to me, it meant like I could just live my life because yeah. it really gave me everything I wanted. Like mm-hmm. I don't care about like being officially a, <laughs> like it, yeah. I could I could I could work and I can be here legally and not have to worry about the because I remember like uh, when I was I think I was like nineteen or whatever else I was walking down the street and it was like six in the morning so still like kind of like. Um, uh, early morning and um, I got pulled like I, I was walking I saw the police lights flashing on me you know, you know the, the, the side mm-hmm. light, and they were like yeah like you know put your hands in the air and they had me like like searched me and they asked for, for my ID and I only had my high school ID you know mm-hmm. and um, and they let me go it was in response to like a robbery nearby and they were like oh we, you know we thought maybe but I remember that they were like, you know, you got to get a driver's license. What are you doing? You know? Mm. And I was like, oh, I'm scared to drive. I forget what I said. And you were young enough. You could yeah, kind of play yeah, it I could get away. Yeah. But after that, I was susp- I was scared because I was like, what do I, what if I run into that guy again? You know, what if I, and I was like, just having that fear of, I remember, like, it's, 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 it's such a long time ago, but I do remember just, just being scared of any interaction with the police. And, yeah. um, so what what that meant to me is like just a huge that huge burden lifted off my shoulder. That fear, I, I, I yeah. don't even have to think about that. Yeah, I'm like good. I can talk shit to the police. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, well, <laughs> and I, mean, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, but like yeah. Yeah, just in general, I, I, I have. I, I don't even have to think about. It's that. a relief. Yeah. yeah. Did you do you remember literally like when you got it, just being like, holy shit, I can't believe this. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. It, it, I really when when I got the card, I was like, Jesus Christ, like I. It, it it's it's like a paradigm shift it's just like this is a new this is actually it just it felt like okay now i can start living my life i, I can wow. actually start planning my future i also don't know why the burden is on us to be people of color like i didn't agree with that that's a raw deal like how about we just call white people people of no color <laughs> And the rest of us just keep people. <laughs> as, a, as an undocumented kid growing up, I didn't have any like role models. You know, there's no like famous undocumented anything. Like as a kid growing up, I wish we had like an undocumented superhero, like a like a superhero that like fought crime but like had to leave before the police came. <laughs> The local police chief is like, it's great that he's fighting crime, but he's taking our jobs. <laughs> Being a document, if, if I return to Peru, um, there's a 10-year bar before I can even apply again to return. To the U.S.? To the U.S., yeah. Wow. So I have to wait 10 years before I can even start the process of applying. Which, after that 10 years, it could take another, another 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's that's what underlies the they want to maintain that stupid thing yeah yeah do you um when you got that paperwork how do they how do you prove like that you were brought here as a child like what's the what's the juristic like how do i prove that i was here every year yeah Yeah. or or like they're the rule it's dax for kids who were brought here yeah had no control how do you prove that you were that child like how do you it, it really is like collecting every report card, every, everything. Wow. So showing just how long you, you have been here. just have proved that I was, which was like, you know, wow. between, yeah, luckily my parents did keep, keep yeah. all that. Like, yeah, uh, report cards, uh, high school, like everything, literally everything that shows that, oh, this guy was here, that you just, 
I think. Do you print out your Facebook? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. basically. <laughs> uh yeah. my space yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah i remember it was like a huge uh folder yeah. which is a bunch of like just you have to like i remember the, the person who was helping us Violet worked for a non-profit non-profit she, she was like yeah just overkill just just really as much like as, possible. as much as possible there's no just overdo it um so yeah it really yeah whatever it could be anything phone bill or whatever yeah wow yeah so how many um kids or how many dreamers did that uh, i think the program was uh at the time when it when it, i believe the number was around eight hundred thousand mm. to a million yeah oh. and now um it's effectively it's on it's in limbo right now so that means people can't sign up for it for the first time so there's kids that are graduating high school who who are mm. who, who are in the same position that i was right so now it's up to like 1.2 million like it's growing and there's there's kids now yeah, I, I feel terrible for them. They, they don't. They're literally in the same position that I was, and I, I remember what that's like. It's it's, it's fucking terrible. <laughs> Growing up, uh, English wasn't my first language, so I had a hard time understanding like common phrases and how they were used. Like the phrase, "We'll see about that," because when you break that phrase down, all it means it's happening. It's coming in the future, but you can't say "We'll see about that" like in a non-threatening manner. Like if a friend comes up to you and's like, "Oh yeah, some sick one's pregnant, and the baby's doing March." Yeah, we'll see about that. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Growing up, I went to public school. Uh, I, I always used to hear that phrase, uh, say no to drugs. Remember that phrase? There? Yeah. Whoever coined that phrase, say no to drugs, uh, was obviously never offered any, like in real life. Because <laughs> you don't say no to drugs, you know, that's way too confrontational. <laughs> You just say I'm good, right? <laughs> That's what the phrase should be. Say I'm good to drugs. <laughs> I think the like the worst part of this whole thing has been like having to like fight for my rights. <laughs> Going to protest? Ugh, it's terrible. Gotta go somewhere and find parking. <laughs> now I gotta listen to this dude play the drums. Ugh. <laughs> I also have a hard time relating to how radical the rhetoric is sometimes, because the most popular slogan for undocumented activists right now is "undocumented and unafraid," which is a badass slogan, and I understand why it exists. But sometimes I'm afraid, you know? <laughs> I'm a coward. <laughs> so I was thinking, how can I personalize that slogan for me? You know, undocumented, unafraid. And the best I could come up with, and I might rock this at the next protest, is uh, undocumented and uncircumcised. <laughs> <laughs> Just so everyone's confused, like, what the fuck is he protesting exactly? Like, is he like... An undocumented men's rights activist. Like, it's, it's I right, thank you guys so much. Have a good night. I'm used to this undocumented shit, but bombing in front of people is like the worst. No, that I, hurts. I, I, that's a more urgent situation to fix. And I, so, in my first year, I was terrible. I was like a shy fucking. I, I had no. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think because I was just so focused on just comedy, like just fucking figure this out. It didn't even, occur. and I was just, and also I just, I didn't have like, I, you know, I was still young. I didn't have anything to say. You know? I wasn't like talking about immigration on, uh, on stage. So I was just feeling like, oh, how can I be funny? Like, what, what do I, what's my, what do I have to like, you know, just, I, just doing dumb jokes and shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, it didn't really come up. I, I and, and you know, with my friends and my comedian friends, yeah, we were, we would just talk about comedy. We would just talk about, you know, you know how it is. Like you just, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you got uh, your papers in 2012. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. I got my DACA. Yeah. Or, yeah. So then, what? What was life like after that? Oh, it was incredible. It was uh, the best of times. <laughs> Guys, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this fucking legally living here. I would Popping bottles. And highly just... recommend it. It was um, no, it really was. I really look back. Even though, you know, whatever happens next year, if I lose it, I'm still going to look back at it fondly. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, better, good it's, years. it's, it's, it's better to have lo loved and lost <laughs> than not loved at all. I don't regret anything. Um, so you started work on a one-man show? Yes. 
called why your home Miranda should be deported <laughs> yes and how did that come about uh so uh my Ramon, Ramon Rivas, comedian Ramon Rivas, he was running a show at the, I forget the name of the art gallery. <laughs> Shout out to them. Uh, <laughs> is it on the west side? It's on the La Brea and Third or something, uh, I think. The oh, middle. the first place you ran it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I forgot yeah, yeah, the name. Yeah. And so they got, like, they were putting on an exhibit as part of uh, Getty's Pacific 2020 uh, thing. It's like an annual uh, exhibit on Latinos um, and they that, uh, that particular uh, exhibit was in, interested in immigrant um, the immigrant experience so I met with he, Ramon put me in touch with the owner the art gallery owner and a representative from the Getty and they were like oh what do you want to do and I was like I don't know <laughs> and they were like well you want an hour and I was like Hey, in LA, you'll you'll never do yeah. an hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like sure like yeah. not, not, I just said yes because I'm not I'm never gonna do an hour in LA so after I said yes, I was like, all right, well, what, are, what exactly do I have to say? Or what, what, what am I going to do? So I had to think about, like, well, if it's going to be about immigration, what's my take on immigration? What's my point of view? And I thought about it. And, you know, when, after I broke it down, I kind of, you know, realized, you know, uh, I, don't, I, I, don't, when it, I don't really contribute much to this country, um, you know, by, by any way you slice it. Uh, whether it's like economically or um, morally or like, you know, aesthetically. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it's not, I, I don't bring much to the table. So I was thinking, oh, well, I probably should be deported. And so I, I, st <laughs> I, st I start from there and sort of figure out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so the show's called Why Your Horn Man Should Be Deported. And when you're putting together a specific show around this central theme, have did you treat it differently than just putting together like a 30, 45 minute like stand up set? Yeah, it's it's um it's it's been a learning experience for me because I think um it's, doing stand up I just I don't I don't think I've never thought of it this way before. Like I I just like oh what bit am I going to try at the mic? You know, and then when I do a showcase, I just collect those bits <laughs> and do ten minutes. And and so, it's, it's this is this has been a learning experience for me, where it's like, oh, I have to like think about a subject and write on it, and it's like writing a novel. It's like fucking. It's mm -hmm. hard. I don't know. I, I've, I've I've I'm grateful for the experience, but yeah, it has been a struggle. So so like the first time you performed it, did it feel different than? just doing stand-up did it feel very like for lack of a better word like one man showy it uh, you know it's yeah it, it did feel different and uh i this is something i've I'm, i still am conflicted about which is i it i i call it i call it a one-man show because i i just have nothing else to call it's it's, it's uh the only difference is that it's an hour that i'm just committed this is what i'm going to do because i think stand-up in general there's an understanding that it's a dynamic interaction between a comic and an audience whereas a, if i say it's a one-man show i'm just like i'm just gonna do this so fuck you yeah right. <laughs> you, you don't know? have to worry about the last yeah yeah, yeah yeah I'm make it real I'm committed to the bit you yeah know? <laughs> uh, and so i you know doing it i don't know i've uh, maybe i'll get your guys thoughts on it. i i kind of like doing this i kind of resent that we do have to <laughs> include <laughs> do the hour. audience yeah, ever consider the audience uh, I, I, it's funny. i mean i, I try know. never to consider that yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, I, I go against I, them actually i guess what i resent is i have to call it a one-man show for people to respect it to people for people to be like oh let's let him do something right as mm. opposed to if i just do stand-up they're like oh i'm not laughing he changed the subject yeah right Ooh, yeah <laughs> like yeah i got kind of resent now after the fact like oh well why 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 do why are we beholden to the <laughs> <laughs> why do we need it Th there's something just like i guess classy about like a one-man show which is crazy because in stand-up it's looked at as lower than stand-up well, that's what that's what i resent i right. resent that i resent i do resent that it's, it's like you can't win either way because if you go into one world <clears throat> stand-ups look down right yeah, yeah and then the other one one man shows look down right yeah yeah and yeah <laughs> but i will say i i saw it i i saw your first uh -huh. um your first run and i loved it it felt it felt like a very cohesive just like stand-up yeah. show yeah. and what i really liked i just wanted to say in general and i that was the angle you were going for anyways was like it was a very funny and frank look at it without 
and I think a lot of your point is that, like you were saying, not that you should be deported, but that you're not the like, and this kid is like yeah. about to be a doctor at Harvard, but they can't be like, you know, yeah. you don't have yeah. the like the headline mm-hmm. sob story. And, mm-hmm. you know, not that those kids like don't deserve that. I'm just saying that like, you're like, I'm just a regular person. And that was a really refreshing take on your experience. Yeah. That, that's something I've been trying to be careful with this, with this, with this, just in general. Like, I think, you know, I'm, People in my situation are, cro- are referred to as dreamers. You know, mm-hmm. there's that narrative of like these are the uh, innocent. Uh, th- don't blame them. Blame their parents. Or like, yeah. you know, these are just like innocent fucking college students or, or whatever. These are just great kids. I was like, which you know, um, which I don't relate to. I mean, I, I, I it's, it's. Uh, I didn't go to college, and and it's also just like who, like it's a boring thing. I don't. It's just a fucking who cares. <laughs> Yeah, fucking goody two shoes. Like, get, get, get over yourself. Squares. Squares. Yeah, yeah. These fucking squares. With your fucking... Only you can see. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I also didn't go to college. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And on top of that, it's also a, a harmful narrative because it, it does create that binary of the good immigrant and the bad immigrant. These are the good immigrants. They're like innocent. They're let's, let's save them. And but implicit in that analysis is the idea that there are immigrants that are bad or whatever, or they're not. They don't contribute. Like it's just. It, it, it's also just counterproductive because it's like the Dream the Dream Act was introduced in 2001 in, in Congress, and it's been damn near 20 years, now, 19 years, you know. Wow. And the Dream Act, as much as I would love it for it to happen, the uh, Clean Dream Act, it only affects like a million people. Like mm-hmm. we're, we're we're talking about 11 million now, and it's going to be way more when once we start feeling the effects of climate change. Uh, yeah. The migration that that brings about. So I, I, what uh, something I'm very like mindful of is, is like, we just don't have time to be like, fucking going over like who's like who's a good immigrant who's a who's like a, who's deserving of citizenship. Like it doesn't. We just I I don't even want to perpetuate that conversation. Right? Yeah. I don't. I think it's a it's a misdirection. I think it's it's. We need to just move on past it. We don't have time yeah. to even just. It's inhuman. Indul- it's inhumane. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 inhumane. It's indulgent. It's it's. We we should just move on. Yeah. From that conversation. They do that with black people too. They do that with. Um, you need to kind of be remarkable. Yeah. Or yeah. no one gives a shit about you. Yeah. But they do that with a lot of groups yeah, of people, yeah. and it's ridiculous. That's why I love the title of your show mm-hmm. because it's just very like. I'm just a fucking person. I'm a human, you know, <laughs> yeah. going yeah. off of what you said, Katie. Yeah. 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 I really enjoyed it. So you've been working, workshopping it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what are the plans for it now? Um, I'm going to, I don't have any um, dates set yet, but I do plan on doing it again. 20, 2020, look out for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. I'll, I'll be doing it again here in LA and in the Bay. And I do have to say about one man shows, I think the tide is changing on like, any stigma about that or stand up because I just think like there's such good like you had Phoebe Waller Bridge, Mike Birbiglia doing stuff. Like mm-hmm. even back in the nineties, like Julia Sweeney, mm-hmm. her one man shows were like mm-hmm. they inspired me. Like yeah. John Leguizamo, like you have all these yeah. people who are taking yeah. whatever like art it is and like I don't know. I feel yeah. like one man shows are now being coming a thing where it's like this is this is a piece of art that's yeah. amplified into like you know what i mean totally, into totally. like a a real into like a theme a narrative yeah. a story you know no absolutely uh, there's uh because I, I one of my i love the john leguizamo's uh was freak um, yes I, 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 i'm a huge fan yeah and i almost hesitate in calling my shit a one-man show because he's like actually like dancing singing like he's, yeah he's performing the fuck out of he's that. doing for characters an, for an yeah. hour like straight and i'm just up there with a microphone like i'm just doing <laughs> so, I, yeah. So, but yeah, I don't, yeah yeah i mean i think it's, you, you like uh, yeah i try not to get involved like i guess it's, it's the debates about what the craft or what categorization like who cares just yeah like, if you like it you like it you don't you know, you know? right yeah. what can people do like what do you feel now that we know of course like this next year is going to decide the fate uh-huh. of of yeah. you and daca uh-huh. what what can people like do to help you <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> Uh, there's multiple, you know, however you want to get engaged, definitely get engaged. Uh, Can we um, get your Venmo? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just, that's how you help. Yeah. You add, you know, Patreon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's hard. That, I mean, it would help if, you know, obviously if uh, like it, it's hard to answer that because I, I don't know. I, I guess I'll give you my answer. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
it would help if Bernie was president, I guess, or something like that. Like um, that could help um, to maybe donate to him. Uh, or, or if you want to get involved at a more local level, there's more. Uh, there's a group called California Immigrant Youth Justice Alliance. Alliance Tija that they do great work. They helped in private prisons in California. Oh wow! Um, that Gavin Newsom was forced to sign. Um, there's so there's that. There's there's still in every state. There's local uh, actual like more radical immigrant led organizations um or, but i think in general i mean it's also hard to answer because it's i think it affects everything like like with ha like in la specifically you know we have a housing crisis you know mm -hmm. you have a uh like that, that's that's the thing that's 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 like even if i have daca like and it somehow remains like i'm still struggling i'm still like there's still you know, wait yeah still economic like, pay, pay the just... rent and like and that's what kills me about san francisco is like san francisco is technically a sanctuary city mm. it's like okay that's great to who like, but <laughs> economically yeah yeah so it's like I, it is like yeah, yeah. intersectional like I really uh, 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 we have to yeah it, it, everything goes hand in hand but yeah uh yeah both burning <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. watch uh yeah. <laughs> johan randis uh beautiful stand-up he's so funny he really yes. is you are so refreshing yeah. i mean there's so many comedians in la but it's so nice to see people that are just like different um just styles too i don't know it's just it's just so refreshing yeah ever since you moved here when i met yeah. you i think back in 2015 it must have been yeah. um you always are someone who stands out comedically thanks so uh, yeah, if you want to support um, DACA recipients, undocumented people, great yeah. comics, go see his shows, mm -hmm. both at clubs and also keep an eye out for his mm -hmm. one-man show. Where, those, where can we find you? Uh, on Twitter or Instagram, at Johan Comedy. There we go. Johan, thank you so much thank for, you. Yeah, thanks for being here. Me. All right, bye. Living glam, living rough, living with Jonathan and Katie.